This is Ricardo Comitar, Christopher Kellner, and Mark Otten, in conjunction with Sander Connolly and Michael Sisti, leading you through a retrosigmoid craniectomy. After intubation and Foley placement, the Mayfield head holder is placed with two pins low on the contralateral occiput and one pin on the ipsilateral frontal region. The patient is then rotated and positioned either full lateral or supine with their head turned. A shoulder bump may be useful in the supine position. The patient should be moved as high up and as far over towards the side of the bed as possible to allow optimal space for the surgeon. Head position is adjusted to ensure adequate venous return and airway pressures. The surgical area is then shaved in preparation for a linear incision, two finger breaths behind the ear, spanning approximately two centimeters above the pinna down to the level of C1. Perioperative antibiotics are administered. The surgical field is then prepped and draped in usual fashion, including sterile towels, iaban, and a craniotomy drape. A linear incision is made as planned, down to bone over the occiput and down to muscle more caudal. The suboccipital bone is exposed and the dissection is carried down to the level of the foramen magnum or C1 depending on the size of the craniotomy needed. A combination of bovi cautery, bipolar cautery, and gentle traction are used to remove soft tissues near the foramen magnum. Cerebellar retractors are used to maximize exposure. Adequate bone visualization includes a portion of the mastoid process, the asterion, and the low occiput approaching the foramen magnum. At this time, a craniectomy is performed using a combination of high-speed drill and rongeur instruments, taking care to leave the dura intact. The craniectomy is extended with the transverse and sigmoid sinuses providing the superior and lateral limits, respectively. The medial and inferior limits depend on the case and the amount of exposure necessary. Emissary vein bleeding is controlled with wax. Sinus bleeding is controlled with gel foam and gentle pressure. The mastoid air cells, when violated, should be thoroughly waxed. Once an appropriately sized craniectomy has been achieved, reticulous hemostasis is obtained and the wound is copiously irrigated to remove bone dust and debris. The dura is opened in a linear fashion down towards the foramen magnum with a 4 silk suture, 11 blade, and either long straight scissors or dental tool. At this point, the cisterna magna may be opened to drain CSF and provide brain relaxation. The dural opening is then extended superiorly and teed off towards the transverse sigmoid junction. The dural flaps are reflected using 4 silk sutures. Wet sponges and towels are placed at the edges of the surgical domain and the Greenberg retractor system is assembled. The exposed cerebellum may be covered with Surgicel and Telfa for protection. Closure of a retrosigmoid craniectomy begins after meticulous intracranial hemostasis is obtained. Primary dural closure is attempted using 4 silk sutures. Duracil and or a synthetic dural substitute are applied prior to performing a cranioplasty with methyl methacrylate and wire mesh. The wound is generously irrigated to remove debris and devitalized tissue. Zero vicral interrupted sutures are used to create a tight fascial closure. Subdermal sutures are then placed with three ovicrals and the skin is approximated with staples. The wound is properly dressed with bacitracin ointment, telfa, and tegaderm.